It is fantastic to have you on the show today. For the benefits of those people listening, we first met back in 2014 in the Gold Coast in Australia when we were both speaking at a friend of ours' a show called Retail Global. Actually, I don't think it was called Retail Global then, was it? It went through a phase where it called about 17 different names. It was not yeah. Pisa anymore. Right. It was something else. Something else. So Phil Lay, a good, good friend of both of ours, he, he put on this show, invited me to speak, invited Ali to speak. I had the opportunity to meet her, spend some time with her. Amazing speaker. If you ever get the opportunity to see Ali to speak, then take the opportunity to do that. Uh, so Elisa, welcome to Bad Decisions with Jim Banks. Good to have you here. Best time, Bad Decisions with Jim Banks. Actually, it was at that show that I learnt Bad Decisions with Jim Banks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, can be people listen. How long has bad decisions been around? See, it's probably been about ten years. Right? I think that was when it, the, the phrase was coined. And funny enough, uh, Alita and I were talking in the green room about uh, where else we'd been. We talked about a boss. We went to um, HubSpot's uh, inbound event in Boston. Yes. And so we were staying with Phil. Phil had booked an Airbnb for all of uh, him and his team. And Alita and I just we jumped on the bandwagon. So Phil was sleepwalking a little bit, uh, and Alita and Olivia and I. <laughs> Yeah. So, so we were out on the balcony and we got locked out. And so Phil came down and I went into the, the kitchen to get a drink and we were knocking on the windows and he just completely ignored us. I think he was literally sleepwalking. He was sleepwalking and he just waved, smiled and waved at us and then just went off to bed. <laughs> so so in the end, Olivia shimmied down the drains at the side of the Airbnb, go through the front door and let, let us in. Otherwise, we, you could still be stuck in that Airbnb in Boston now. I I think so. If there wasn't that ladder and Olivia climbing down, I think we definitely would have been stuck because even the next day when we told Phil about it, he goes, oh, did I see you guys? I didn't know that. <laughs> and then announced that he was renowned to sleepwalk uh, sometimes yes. in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyway, that's one of our bad decisions together. So tell us a little bit about who, where are you, who, what do you do, all that sort of stuff. Cool. So I'm Alita. I am the founder and managing director of MI Academy. We're Australia's most awarded project-based training firm. We specialize in digital marketing, customer experience and innovations and organizational change. So they're the four areas that we operate in and have a lot of fun helping businesses to think more innovatively, more creatively and drive better results out of their marketing and their team. So that's that piece. I've been doing this for roughly about 10 years now, I think. And my career started off, I was working for a number of marketing automation companies. And at the time, I was getting kicked out of a lot of boardrooms just saying, marketing automation isn't going to be a thing. We're still doing direct mail. Come back and talk to us if this ever takes off. Mind you, four years later, I was getting a lot of calls from CEOs saying, help, we need help, come and fix our database. Things aren't working for us. Like, oh, okay. No help, no worries. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should, well, uh, so, I'm located in Australia, if you can't tell. Uh, and Yes, I was going to say, where, where are you? Yeah, one fun fact about Australians is the only time we actually say mate is when we're overseas and or if we don't like someone. Oh, okay. That's interesting to know. <laughs> so if, if I see you calling somebody mate, then I know where that sits. It's a passive um, so where about Australians, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so whereabouts in Australia are you? I'm in Victoria, uh, in Melbourne. Right, okay. Because again, I, I follow you on Instagram and I see pictures of you and you seem to be you know, traipsing around a farm sometimes. Tell me a little bit about that. What's that all about? I really have the best of both worlds in my life and I feel so blessed and not one day goes by where I'm not grateful for what I have in my world. So during the week for work, I'm here in Melbourne and then I'm up in what I like to refer to as God's country, which is up in around the Kings Valley region, up near Bright. It's in the northeast of Victoria. There's a lot of ski fields and just stunning the world that uh, i think it's the biggest quartz deposit crystal quartz deposit in the southern hemisphere is here in a mountain called mount buffalo and i've got about 54 acres bunch of cows a couple of horses about an acre's worth of vineyard that we do wine with every couple of years you know not every year you get great it or just drink it yourself 
actually in 2020, I stopped drinking. So love sharing it and the rest of the family definitely enjoy it. And I always cook with it because that's my passion and love food cooking. And that, that doesn't count for drinking though, does it? If you cook with it? I don't think so because <laughs> all the alcohol gets evaporated. <laughs> exactly. That's the point. There we go. And so, so when we first met, the, the company was called Milk It Academy, which I thought was a great name for a business. Why did you change from Milk It Academy to MI? Couple of reasons. So I loved Milk It as well. And it was on the premise of milk your business for what it's worth. Get everything out of it that you possibly can. Plug all the holes in your leaky bucket and, and we'll help you grow. But we started to make a transition and started to attract more enterprise accounts. And we were getting some feedback that there was negative connotation to that, that we were going to milk our clients, which was not in any way, shape or form what we wanted to portray into the market. And we were also starting to develop some programs in innovation. So having this marketing piece of the business and then the innovation part of the business, we thought, sort of thought, well, we can still lean on MI, Milk It and Marketing Innovation Academy, it's probably time that we need to grow up. Um, and before- Put on some I big knew, girl pants, right? Yeah, <laughs> big girl pants on. And the team was starting to grow and just these enterprise accounts, it just meant that we really needed to grow up. But before I met you, Jim, for a couple of years, or I was just working as a consultant and it was still as Milk It, but, and it was Milk It Digital Strategy. And the logo was a cow that had these enormous udders with these beautiful nipples. And she was just this cow with this, <laughs> with her boobs on show. <laughs> love it. Absolutely love it. Okay. So, so obviously your, your prime, primary focus is helping businesses with kind of project-based training. Tell us a little bit about how that kind of works. What, what does it involve? Yeah, so project-based training is unique. There's only a few companies who do it around the world and it is something that is definitely taking off and uh, we've definitely been ahead of our time and a lot of agency models in, in Europe are starting to shift towards this type of a model. So what this means is that we take a goal that you have in the organisation, like we want to improve our email marketing revenue by 30% within the next 90 days. We have a team in the business who are marketers, but they aren't specialists in email marketing. In order, in order for us to do that and to get to this result, we need to have specialist email marketers in the business. So instead of going out to an agency, we bring it back in-house. We train those skills whilst we're executing on a project so that we can get that 30% uplift. By the way, we haven't hit anything less than 90% uplift in the last since we started basically within 90 days. So training the skills in-house, executing at the same time. So you're recognizing the training investment uh, with financial outcomes really quickly within the organization. Sounds Does that good. make sense? And you, I'm always amazed at how inefficient sometimes businesses are. And I think a lot of it is they don't know what they don't know. They have money, but they have problems to solve. And I think sometimes it takes a an independent set of eyes and a look at a problem to actually see where the solutions fit. And from that perspective, you're probably perfect for doing that. I've watched you present at conferences. I've watched you, you know, when you've exhibited at conferences as well. You, you and your team, very proficient, effective, and really good at uncovering the information that will help businesses and grow. Yeah, we're absolutely systemized around how we ask different questions and not only are we trainers, we're also coaches. So we're really helping you to really digging deep to find out what that problem is so that we can have laser focus on what's going to get you the best uplift so that we can leave you with a formula that is replicatable so that the value of what we do isn't just in the time that we spend with you, like an agency that'll spend it with you on a campaign and then that might be the end of it. It's replicatable and sustainable long-term. And where does AI sit in, in like your thought process because for me at the moment i'm trying to kind of wrap my head around it as of, i went to a conference in uh, utah park city i was part of the sundance film festival i was just over there for 16 days been in vegas then drove up to utah to uh, to see a friend and, and see a client and got invited to this ai event in park city and i was blown away by one how many people were interested but two some of the, the business cases what are your thoughts on ai in respect of, are you concerned about it? Do you think it's going to take away jobs? Right? All the sort of things that people are worried about. 
I think at the moment, AI is still making a lot of mistakes and we need to have that human intervention. And you can see when a brand goes AI first and takes away that human intervention and there's so many mistakes that are made there because the systems aren't designed for empathy and they and they miss a lot of context. So I'm not concerned about it taking people's jobs. I think if we frame it correctly, we can help to use it to enhance people's jobs, which is how we're using it. We use it in a whole bunch of different ways, everything from how do we develop and optimise copy, how do we use it to analyse data and find out when we should be sending emails or what we should be doing with a landing page based on the information that we can get out of of things like GA4, Google Analytics 4, and how do we use it to optimise project efficiency? So there's great tools out there. One of the organisational um, alignment piece that we do where we're working with teams to help them to become more efficient and g- put good rhythms and rituals in their business so that they can become more effective is really where we're using it as well. Monday is an amazing tool and has a lot of really good AI built into it in order to help help businesses become more effective and efficient with their project management. I actually, I think the biggest opportunity for businesses right now, before they go and do any other projects, is to really get very efficient around project management because I see it all the time. Businesses are piling things on top of things on top of things, competing priorities. Nobody really, their job descriptions start to become really wishy-washy and you can't start to move up and through marketing efficiency, marketing maturity models without having good base ground for project management. I mean, we've been using a a lot of tools for managing clients and internally. We we just got access to Notion Q&A AI, Ah, which is literally going to come out in beta. Honest to God, it's like mind blowing what this thing can do. If you ask it questions of everything in your entire database, I mean, we've got so much stuff in our database, and I can just go ask, uh, a ask questions of the database. Show me the top five brands in e-commerce or supplements or something like that, and it'll give me a list of all the the, the brands that we've got in our database. So I don't have to sit there and try and run a filter and a sort and all that sort of stuff. I can kind of go in and, and ask it questions, which is one of the benefits of having something like AI to be able to go and just ask questions of the data that you have and when we everything that we're talking about here is like is the tip of the iceberg what i'm really interested in and what i'll be focusing on in the future is what are some of the products that we can build in with ai in order to make chat gpt a lot more effective for us what are some of the integrations that we can use just kind of scratching the surface here yeah. I mean, I don't, don't think that AI is ever going to take the place of a, a good handshake, a hug, a dinner, a lunch. I mean, I went to, to Utah, spent a week with my client. We went out for lunches and dinners and I got to see the kids and we went to a, on a show in one of the theaters. And those are the sorts of things AI will never, ever be able to do. No. So, you know, they'll be able to create those experiences. It's a collaboration. Of course, absolutely. And, and for me, it's all about making things more efficient and effective. As an agency owner, I don't get paid for do-overs. None, my team, if they make a mistake, we have to redo something. Like we're not going to get paid for the same job twice. So for me, using AI it helps eliminate some of those uh, fallible points where people kind of stray off the track that they're supposed to be on and keep us focused on the job at hand. Exactly, exactly. Um, at least I, wa- I watched you on, on a webinar the other day. You were talking about hack games. I, when I was watching, I'm like, wow, that sounds so, so interesting. Tell me a little bit about hack games. What's yeah, it all about? And this is, it's in its fifth year now. So this is our innovation incubator event for the retail and e-commerce industry in Australia. A couple of years ago, we did it across across Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong, and New Zealand all in one day. That was massive. How it all came about was... In 2019, I was thinking, how do we get our community together and show them what we do at MI Academy and what project-based training and all the elements that go along with that can do for you as an organisation? And it can't be a lunch and learn because a lunch and learn is where I can do a product demo. We don't have a product to demonstrate I can show you case studies that's pretty boring we've got plenty of them and you can download them but how do we take people into an immersive learning environment which is what project-based training is and show them what they can get out of it and 
my thought was, well, hackathons are really great for that kind of thing. And I ran some really amazing hackathons for girls in tech when I was on their board. And I thought, why don't we do a competitive style hackathon event for the retail industry? And that's how Hack Games was born. So we collect about 50 people every single year. Those people have to apply in order to get through because we want to make sure that we collect the right talent that have the right set of skills. And it's not to say that you have to be a marketer to be a hacker or a hack games player. You have to either have finance background, you can have ops background because we like to create um, cross-functional teams because that's part of what we do when we're going through the innovation cycles at MI Academy. It's how we create efficiency um, so that people can experience what a cross-functional team can do within a couple of days' time. They're given a problem statement that they need to work through, a whole bunch of innovation templates that we use in our innovation planning at MI Academy. And we give them about four every year. We rotate them every couple of years or if the problem statement needs a different type of template, we'll bring that in. And then they work through these templates in, in order to come out with the final exercise, which is what we call the crazy eights, where once you've gathered all your data and information, then you start to develop a whole bunch of different ideas in rapid fire. Then you go through um, an assumption busting process to find out which idea is actually the best one to solve the solution. Then you solve the problem. Then you start to develop what the full solution is going to look like. And that gets pitched to a panel of judges. This year, it's getting pitched to uh, a bunch of different investors and people are getting given hack bucks and it's a crazy fun innovative day where people come in super nervous not knowing what they're in for and then they leave going that was the best event I've ever been to thank you so much for inviting me just sounds like the apprentice but for people without egos basically yes <laughs> that's a good way to put it I've done a bit of speaking over the years and we've gone to events and I, I mean, like you, I've hosted a few events here and there. Um, I've had clients that have run events and I know, I know how stressful that can be. Uh, and, and again, I don't, I don't know what your thoughts are, but for me, I, I think that the event industry has really, I mean, although it's kind of back to normal as in like everything's open, mm. I don't really think the event industry kind of got back to where it was prior to COVID. And I think it's probably because there's been a bit of a knock on of, you know, the venues that have opened up have had like this backlog of events that used to be in say October. Now they can't get booked in October. So they're having to try and find another slot. How do you actually choose which events to sponsor or exhibit at, speak at, organize? Because for me, it's, I, I'd love to like, get your take on what, what you think is the best way to kind of go about that. Oof, it's a big question. So we've got a couple of things that we look at. We won't attend event unless one of our team members can speak or uh, invite a client up on stage. And typically we won't sponsor an event if it's just a panel. We want to have, have a, a breakout session or a keynote session because we know what we do is really valuable and we know from history the best way for us to get the most out of an event is to put one of us on stage so that we can collect leads and get people to come to the stand afterwards. In terms of attending an event, I'm really looking for something that has brilliant speakers who are going to be talking about something that I'm really interested in and typically not too many vendors speaking on a stage or if there are vendors speaking on a stage that they are with their clients and that it's not a pitch fest for that vendor. I want to be making sure that I'm there to learn something, which is, I think, a real value when I'm speaking is that it's not a pitch fest. I really deeply care about helping the audience that I'm speaking with. So I'll give over more information than I usually need to. And people could leave something that I'm speaking at and know exactly what to do next if they've got the capabilities in their team. Do you think the audience has changed? When I first mm. started speaking, it was like shooting fish in a barrack. Literally, you stand on stage, you present, and there'd be like a queue of people that would want to come and work with you afterwards. And it was fantastic, right? I loved it and it was great. 
But I've, what I noticed was as the industry has matured and evolved, what tends to happen now is that the people that attend the events are the people that work for the companies rather than the decision makers and budget holders. Right? So the people that go don't have the authority to be able to say, hey, I want to hire you to do stuff. And the people that historically used to be there are not there anymore because they're focusing on running the business rather than like learn what the best SEO techniques are. I, I didn't know if you, if you found the same in, in kind of your line. Yeah, definitely notice that. And I think it also comes down to the size of the business. There's a couple of things. So enterprise businesses are sending a lot of younger talent in to go and learn and develop. And then you've got the emerging businesses where you'll still sometimes get a founder showing up maybe with two or three of their team and they kind of disperse and go about their day in order to learn what they need to which is why I think when it comes to marketing a B2B business, you have to think like a consumer-based business because you're dealing with a person at the end of the day. So you need to have a mixture of what are you writing in industry publications right through to where you're speaking. And then, of course, you need to have the digital element, which is YouTube's Reels, TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> involved with retail global and phil in his event was his passion he raised a ton of money for good causes and one of the causes that he raised money for was the retail orphanage initiative mm. which i think was original like a u.s thing but you're now uh, involved in that in australia is that right or is it the whole of southeast southeast asia uh Australasia? It, yeah know. really really good time to bring this one up because so phil if anything he's an incredibly passionate human being and he loves helping people and he's so genuine about the way that he goes about that. And it was started in the United States and Phil wanted to bring a chapter here and he asked me if I would be the chairperson of that charity because I had previous board experience with other charities and naturally I said yes because of Phil's passion but also the projects that had been done. Over the last couple of years we've raised about a quarter of a million dollars and we've done some amazing things like built a hospital in Haiti in a town called Bercy which is one of the poorest towns in the world and some of the stories that come out from there are just heartbreaking. I remember watching the video that was made where they were talking about the kids eating glass that had been baked in the sun and clay and yeah the mud out I mean, of the sea. Tears running down my face it was like horrible I, I say horrible it wasn't horrible. I mean, it was an amazing video, great story, right? and fantastic that Phil and Jeremy and a whole bunch of people went to Haiti to sort this hospital out because it had been closed for such a long time. I was happy to put up uh, a day of my time as a consulting. It's the auction that, that always kind of raised such great money. I mean, they used to sell a box of nothing, which was fantastic to watch. $50,000 for a box of nothing. I mean, I'm going to get John Lawson as a uh, guest on the podcast, but I just wanted to make sure that whatever was bid for my day got more than whatever was bid for John's day. <laughs> and we were, and neither of us were ever going to be able to beat Bob Schwartz, right? Because Bob Schwartz was, was always going to be able to throw the extra things onto his day and make it worthwhile for the person that was going to be bidding for him. Sounds but again, right, ultimately all it meant was that the charity got tons of more money. Yeah. It, one of the stories that really stands out in my mind for ROI was, and this is why we built the hospital. So the mud cakes thing is, is um, the women in the town make mud cakes and sprinkle a little bit of salt and they dry it out on a, on a basketball court and that's what the children eat. There's about 60,000 orphans every year in Haiti. They've got, they've got generational child trafficking challenges that it's people have been having children in order to traffic them so that they can feed themselves. And it's been going on for generations now, and it's going to take another three generations to stop that. Um, there's a lot of organizations that'll send down canned foods and they'll send down bikes and all sorts of things. But what these people really need is um, sustainable farming, which we've gone and built farms there now so that they don't have to eat. They don't have to eat mud cakes. We've built schools that also have safe housing in it for children. These kids are living in, sticks under sticks with some cardboard over it and hoping that they're going to stay safe from traffickers i just can't even believe that's a multi-billion dollar industry around the world it's sickening that people would want to do this to children and yeah. um and the hospital was built because when phil was there 
there was a woman who was laying on a doorstep and she was, she'd had a miscarriage and she was bleeding heavily and she was going to die. And Phil said, how can we help this woman get to a hospital? And the people said, there's no hospital. Uh, and, but there is a hospital. It's just not operational because the government is so corrupt there. And they pointed to this building that was derelict down the road and that became our mission for the year. And we understood how much money we needed to get to get that hospital up and running and we made that happen. And a really proud moment in our fundraising to see that hospital come alive. I think there was about 270 people that went through that hospital in the first couple of days of just people that needed medical attention. Uh, and, and really makes me so proud to be able to do this In the next 12 months, we're shifting our focus from international aid into local aid uh, because we have a major problem here in Australia as well with with child safety. You can't legally adopt a child here in Australia. They can only go into foster care, which has a whole bunch of complexities and issues around it. There's so many charities that are trying to do something, but these children are so poorly loved and in and out of the system that they're fundamentally heartbroken and and broken and just go into an abuse cycle. It's awful. So we're trying to shift our focus here to make sure that we can get children um, the safety that they need. We want to lobby with the government to make changes and reform the um, foster care and see if we can bring back adoption in this country because you can go and adopt a child from Peru but you can't adopt a child locally it doesn't matter how long they've been living with you so that's our focus is is local communities over the next couple of years and that's where we're going to be doing our fundraising oh that's fantastic and and obviously I'll make sure that all of the things that we just dis- we discussed in the podcast episode today will be in the show notes all the links to the video that will make you cry i promise you and and the retail orphanage initiative i think again for me such a worthy cause wherever it is whether it's haiti locally it, it doesn't really matter it's like it's dreadful that we have these sorts of things going on in the world but we do and we just need to try and do what we can to try and prevent them from happening in the future and the best way of doing that is good people like yourself and phil and jeremy and everyone else that kind of got involved in that going and getting off their asses flying to haiti doing stuff you know just doing doing things over and above what what's expected of them in terms of their normal day-to-day job thank you jim one of the things that really surprised me when i first got involved was um greg who's the founder shared with me that the largest day for child trafficking in the united states is the day of the super bowl which is just insane everybody's attention is so focused and diverted it's like it's like the old, I'll make an aeroplane disappear and they'll traffic hundreds and like tens of thousands of children and women on the day of the Super Bowl because nobody's paying attention. That's quite scary. Mm. Um, changing gears a little bit. Yeah. Um, obviously, one of the, the most important things in running your own business and doing all the sort of stuff that you do is staying motivated and focused. How do you stay motivated? <sighs> I get motiv- stay motivated motivated by the end goal, um, which is which is helping our clients and bringing on more clients to help them to have happier and higher performing teams. Um, every time we finish a program, we have a little brag that we've just lost a client, and it's because which is very different from everybody else. But we're happy we've lost a client because we know that they are more sustainable, and most of the time they come back to us when they've got a new project in mind. Um, but for the purpose of what we're aiming for, it's it's that we lose clients all the time because we want to make sure. Or it's not they'll refer you on to other people as well, right? Well, so that's if they've right. had a good experience. We, in- do you know what we have? a very strange referral problem at MI because people don't want to know that we're this team secret weapon. <laughs> it's funny. I ha- I have the same issue. Like, so I, I run paid advertising and I've always like had really good results from Microsoft and they've always like, can we get a case study and testimony from you? I'm like, no. And they say, why not? And I'm like, look, I don't want everyone else to know how good it is. Right. But obviously everyone's going to know now because I've just put it out on the podcast. Oh, good. Um, you should but- know. <laughs> Yeah. And and obviously MI Academy is great, so you should use them for sure. So what's the future for MI Academy? Most people want to go into business for one of a few reasons. Uh, quite often the reason is they want to grow something, turn it into a unicorn, billion dollar company, blah, blah, blah. What's the future for MI Academy look like? What, what's it going to be? The future for MI Academy is to continue to keep building it. We just had our biggest month on record and we plan to keep moving in that 
in that traje- trajectory. Over the last 12 months, I've cut about 40% out of our delivery time. So we've become a lot more efficient. And the next part for us is actually to start looking for investors and partners that we can continue to keep growing with. So scaling the business. And I think for every entrepreneur, we're always looking for an exit plan. So there's definitely that part in play. So actively working on that part of the business as well. Sweet. That sounds great. So, Alisa, thank you so much for, for spending some of your time today. It's been fantastic to have you on as a guest on the podcast today. Like All of your details will be in the show notes and all that stuff that we talked about before will, will be in the show notes as well, links to where people can get in touch with you socially and everything else. Is there one thing in particular that you would like people listening to the podcast to take action and do for you? Is there something specific that you would love to go, hey, everyone that's on this podcast that listens to it, I want you to do this. I want you to take this action. Whew, okay, there's a couple of things. So, If you want to become more efficient and create a more efficient team, this is what I want you to do. I want you to sit down and write down every single one of your business as usual tasks and write down every single one of your major projects. And I want you to get your team members to do exactly the same because you need to make sure that you have alignment between you as the director of the business and what your team think, what you think are major projects and what your team thinks are major projects. And if you don't have alignment between what those are or if your team doesn't even know what the major projects are, then you've got a bit of an alignment issue and you need to fix that. So write down your BAUs, write down your major projects and start to plot them on what we call the impact matrix, which is what the effort is and what the impact is going to be on the business. I think we might have a download for that. If not, it's definitely in our programs. Ah, there is a course that we have on um, agile project management through eSchool, which is our online learning school. And you can go and check out that course. And I think- I'll make sure we include a link to that in the um, show notes as well. Yeah, great. And uh, I'll set up a code for you. BW. BDWJB. BDWJB. There we go. Bad decisions with Jim Banks 50. Uh, and we'll and we'll give everybody 50% off. But if you are looking for something more tailored, we've got amazing tailored programs. We've actually got a guarantee on our email marketing, 12-week email marketing accelerator at the moment that if we don't get you at least 30% more revenue from your email marketing in 90 days, we will absolutely give you your money back. That's how confident we are that our formulas and training works. And at the time of, of this particular podcast being... Um recorded yahoo and gmail are a bit janky at the moment right? they are so, a bit janky so yeah, at the moment yeah there's definitely, uh, there's definitely an opportunity to revisit and, and make sure that um you know, dial in your email the way it should be absolutely follow that customer journey great well thank uh, again thank thank you so much for being on the on the show today uh we're going to wrap up now and uh, and obviously all the show notes will have all of elita's details and all of the great initiatives that she's involved in her business um it it only leaves me to say, if you if you've been listening to the show, I hope you I hope you enjoyed the the episode. Uh, don't forget to follow us, share share with your friends, tell other people because we can't grow the podcast unless you do that. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you on the next episode of Bad Decisions with Jim Bank.